The evil mastermind is one of the most popular types of villains in fiction, and the more ingenious and diabolical their plans are, the more fondly they tend to be thought of. Not every villain is cut out to be an evil genius, and that's usually okay. Not every villain has to be smart. But problems arise when a villain is presented as smart, but they still do really unintelligent things. These are the characters that want you to think they're five steps ahead of everybody else, but instead just make you go, That's stupid! You're stupid! This is a video about some of those manga villains who are just bad at being bad, and their terrible evil plans. Not necessarily the five worst evil plans in manga, mind you, but certainly five terrible ones. Let's get started right away with terrible evil plan number one. I'm going to spend millions of dollars to get my manga published in Jump, instead of just starting my own fucking publication. In Bakuman, the protagonist manga duo Ashirogi Muto encounter a number of mangaka who become their rivals over the course of the series but only one of them is truly villainous. On two separate occasions, Nanamine uses unethical means to create his manga, first gathering a group of online manga fans to write the story by committee. Eventually, Nanamine's series fails when the story becomes an inconsistent mess, but later on he returns, determined to get revenge on Ashirogi Muto, and prove his methods of creating manga are superior. Only this time, he's taking things even farther. See, it turns out Nanamine's father is a rich businessman. Man, I gotta get me one of those. He loans Nanamine enough money to set up an entire facility dedicated to churning out manga. Hundreds of workers are paid to both write stories by committee and to gauge reader interest before potential stories are assigned to artists, who then pitch the series to Weekly Shonen Jump as their own. Yeah, hey, dude, if you're going to this much trouble, just publish the series yourself. I mean, this would be different if he was planning to eventually use the exposure of his series running in Jump to gain attention prior to launching his own magazine, but it's not. His whole plan is for all of the top-rated series in Shonen Jump to be ones that his company has cooked up, and to prove that his method of creating manga is superior to the traditional method. Here's the thing, though. This is not a financially stable means of creating manga. Even assuming Nanamine would have succeeded in creating several mega-successful manga series, there's no way it would pay off the investment he sank into creating this setup. It'd be a different matter if they created their own magazine and could thus make money off of advertisements and such, but for whatever reason, Nanamine has to have the manga published in Jump so he can compete for ratings with his rivals. He has to engage Ashirogi Muto by Jump's rules. You know, except that he's already breaking their rules by doing this. In the end, Nanamine fails to achieve his ambitions because his last, greatest project fails and he's banned from Jump forever. But even if things hadn't turned out that way, there's no way in hell he could have maintained the setup for long. I didn't really feel that there was a sense of urgency to defeating the guy, considering if they'd waited long enough, his budget would have run out and nobody would have helped him write manga anymore. However, Nanamine isn't the worst financial mind on this list. That honor goes to the brains behind terrible evil plan number two. I'm going to keep betting double or nothing against this guy, instead of just cutting my losses even though I'm supposedly all about the money. This comes from a baseball manga called One Outs, which I only read very recently, but after sparing a bit of time thinking about it, God. Saikawa is a terrible businessman. So here's the plot to provide context to those of you who aren't familiar with the series. A gambling pitcher named Taguchi Toa makes a deal with Saikawa, the CEO of the team he's signing with, to give him a purely performance-based contract in which he'll gain money for earning outs and lose money for allowing runs. The odds initially seem to be in Saikawa's favor, but as time goes on, Taguchi earns more and more money, so Saikawa makes alterations to the contract in the hopes that Taguchi will eventually pay him back. But no matter what he tries, Taguchi not only escapes the situation with his profits intact, but nine times out of ten, he significantly increases them. So Saikawa resorts to more and more extreme bets in the hopes of Taguchi failing, but they inevitably backfire. The idea is that Saikawa's pride is responsible for his downfall. He refuses to compromise with Taguchi and cut his losses because that would mean admitting that Taguchi got the better of him. Which makes sense to a degree, but there are certain problems with accepting this explanation. First of all, Saikawa is portrayed as incredibly frugal. He spends the least amount of money possible on his team and his facilities while still guaranteeing the fans will turn out to maximize his profit, and he cares nothing for how successful the team is. As a result, the team was absolutely pitiful before Taguchi showed up, but was the only one in the league that stayed in the black. Meaning Saikawa isn't just cheap for the sake of being cheap, it actually pays dividends. The fact that he refuses to cut his losses to Taguchi before they reach a certain point is absolutely ridiculous. Especially when you consider that for the duration of the series, he's supposedly playing the long game. See, the whole reason Saikawa is freaking out more and more about Taguchi's ever-expanding salary is that he plans to sell the team at the end of the season, and the amount of money he'll get in return will be ten times the overall profit the team makes during the season. And Taguchi's salary becomes so massive that it starts to wipe that profit out. So yeah, 
The frugal-minded owner is fully aware of the money he stands to lose, but takes no steps to protect it. For another thing, the plans he comes up with to try and wipe out Taguchi's salary are way too complex. You know what he should have done? Break Taguchi's arm! Seriously, at one point there's a provision in Taguchi's contract that if he's unwilling or unable to play when the team wants him to, he'll take a massive penalty. And Saikawa does try to take advantage of this provision, but in a needlessly roundabout manner. He tries to get Taguchi suspended, he pays off opposing teams to try to injure him. Come on, dude, hire a group of thugs, have them ambush this guy, and break his arm. You already hired an accident figure to try and frame the guy and get him suspended, so obviously this is not beneath you. Hell, why did you even bother trying to make that guy the victim? Just have him get in a pickup and T-bone the hell out of Taguchi's ride. Stop making this so difficult. Oh, and one last thing. When you think you've successfully injured Taguchi, have the team's doctors actually fucking examine him. God, you're bad at this. I feel a little mean being so hard on just one guy. Guess I'll try braiding an entire population next. Terrible evil plan number three. We're going to launch a planetary invasion because we're bored and have the munchies. Okay, so there's this really hyper-violent and stupid series called Gantz, and for the entire series, humans use special weaponry to kill various sorts of aliens. Then, during the final super big story arc, one species of aliens launches a full-scale invasion. Cities burn, millions die. Unlike previous aliens in the series, the invaders are specifically meant to be very human-like. They're really large and have bizarre extra eyes, but they're certainly humanoid, and plus their metropolis is incredibly similar to a human city. Okay, so let's think about this for a bit. For what reasons would a sentient race of aliens want to invade Earth? Well, maybe we've got some sort of resource that they want to harvest, or maybe they want to enslave us all for some purpose or another. Maybe they're just hyper-violent and want to kill us. Or maybe they're hungry and want to eat us. Yes, millions of humans are rounded up, shipped to the mothership, and slaughtered so that they can be eaten. As snack food. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if this race could afford to treat humanity this way, but according to this weird-ass looking thing, they can't. They're from a dying star system and they've been traveling across the galaxy looking for places to pillage and survive off of. And hey, there's plenty of life on Earth that they could feed on. So, why humans? Now let me make this point clear, and it's going to sound weird at first, but bear with me. It is not efficient to use humans as a source of food. See, when we cultivate a specific animal species for food, there are a couple of conditions that that species must first meet. First of all, it must be domesticable, and, uh, good luck with that. But secondly, and more importantly, the species must be capable of reproducing at such a rate that they provide a sustainable food supply. For example, chickens start laying eggs when they're six months old. One chicken can lay hundreds of eggs a year, and chickens raised for their meat are slaughtered when they're as young as six weeks old. Compare this to the lifespan of a human. You basically have to wait at least a decade to get the most meat off of us, and you're lucky if you get a mother to have more than one child in a full year. And these aliens are scarfing people down like they're popcorn. I know that some like to point out how weird it is that the purpose of the Matrix was to turn humans into batteries to power the machines, but at least then they'd be supplying fuel for a lifetime instead of just a single meal. Or apparently one twentieth of a meal. Now, and the kicker is that because the invaders are so eager to sample this brand new delicacy, a huge resistance force finds their way onto the mothership, and this is what inevitably cost them the war on Earth. So hey, maybe you should have made sure everybody was dead before trying to eat them, you morons. How the hell was no other planet able to repel these guys unless they had bullshit atomic manipulation powers? Speaking of bullshit powers, let's talk about a Nuchiha. Terrible evil plan number four. I'm going to use the moon to hypnotize people, but not before I warn them all about it. More has come to light recently regarding why exactly the masked Naruto villain Toby decided to put this plan to motion, but I'll avoid that for the sake of those of you who care about spoilers. Toby's plan depends upon a powerful technique which can only be executed by members of the Uchiha clan using their Sharingan, the Tsukiyomi. By making eye contact with the victim, the user is able to trap them inside a world of illusion which they can manipulate freely. Toby's plan is to capture the nine-tailed beasts and combine them into their original form, the ten-tailed beast, which he will then use to power a global-scale version of the technique, called the Infinite Tsukiyomi, and hypnotize everyone on the planet. In order to make eye contact with the world's population, he will reflect the image of his Sharingan onto the moon. This is truly an ambitious plot. Even when nobody knows what Toby is doing, it's sure to be a difficult task. Which is why he decides to tell every one of his enemies about it.
For seemingly no reason, with absolutely no pressure being placed on him, Toby reveals everything about his plan to the five Kages, the leaders of their respective shinobi villages. He just tells them all about it. At this point, the play has been in the making for decades, and Toby still has yet to capture two of the tail beasts, and apparently the only reason he's doing this is in the hopes that they'll give up the two of them once they hear the plan. Naturally, once they hear about it, they say, uh, no. And not only that, but he immediately declares war on all of them, driving them to form an alliance to oppose him. Plus, they decide that keeping Toby away from the remaining tail beasts is top priority, making things even more difficult for him. Dude, you have the ability to walk through walls, hypnotize people, zap anything you want to a pocket dimension, and if you really need to, just alter reality as you see fit. You don't need people's permission to do this stuff, and you certainly don't need to tip your hand to the world by letting them know you're going to rob them of free thought. But I guess that's the thing about having a super powerful villain. If they use their powers correctly, then the heroes would stand no chance. But sometimes the heroes still don't stand a chance, even when the villain uses their abilities in the least efficient manner possible. Let's wrap things up with terrible evil plan number five. I'm going to go to great lengths tormenting this entirely inconsequential dude who threatens to ruin my plans, instead of just killing him immediately. This is from a slasher horror manga called Doubt, in which a group of teenagers are all trapped in a facility and slowly killed off one by one. The entire story is built around the mystery of which of them is killing the others off, and it turns out that it's Mitsuki, who is the love interest to the protagonist, Yu. However, in a last-minute twist, it turns out that Mitsuki's actions have been controlled the entire time by Rei, who used hypnotism to drive her to kill everyone. See, it was established back at the beginning of the story that Hazama Rei is a former child star who became famous for hypnotizing people on her TV show. However, she was accused of being a fraud, and the allegations eventually became so stressful that her family attempted suicide. But Rei survived and was apparently left a cripple, although she's actually faking that, too. When everyone first awakens, Rei is the first one found dead, but it turns out that she just tricked them with hypnotism, somehow. She specifically says her hypnotism doesn't work on everyone, so I'm not exactly sure how she managed to fake being nailed to the wall. But anyway, this whole thing is a sadistic game of revenge for Rey. Because the world made her suffer, she'll use her hypnotism to make the world suffer, and she'll take her time doing it. When her show went off the air, Rey used the last episode to broadcast a hypnotic message, bringing a bunch of weak-willed people under her control. It's not entirely clear how many this worked on, but she's clearly pulling a ton of strings, since she's hypnotized someone in the police force to cover her tracks. So in short, she has an incredible amount of control over the situation, and she can do this as many times as she wants, kidnapping and killing off groups of people without fear of being caught. But how does she react when just the slightest little thing doesn't go according to plan? Rei's hypnotism is not entirely perfect, and Mitsuki starts to resist her influence when she's told to harm you. According to Rei, Mitsuki's love for you causes her influence over her to break intermittently when she's in his presence. So, why doesn't she kill him then and there when she discovers it? He's a danger to her plans, and she's planning on killing him later anyway. He's unconscious and helpless. She should drag him into another room, away from Mitsuki, and kill him. Instead, she just... doesn't. Or hell, she had another follower in the facility who dies later. She could have had him kill you. But she doesn't. Why? I wouldn't have a problem with this if it were originally in her plans to just torture you. I mean, she clearly gets pleasure from provoking him, but that's clearly not the case. She was going to have him killed, but now that he poses an actual threat to her plans, she's going to let him live because her first idea of how to kill him isn't going to work. I mean, yeah, she kills him off eventually, but not until he and Mitsuki are up in a hospital, which only happens because Rei called the police. You know, because, haha, you thought you were safe, but you're not! I only did this because I'm sadistic. I'm totally not an idiot! Plus, he even gets to tell the police that Ray's responsible. And yeah, nobody believes him because she covered up any trace that she was there in the first place, and murder by hypnotism sounds pretty crazy, but what if somebody had believed him? All of a sudden, Ray's perfect operation would have been in jeopardy because she let some guy blow the whistle on her when she was fully capable of preventing him from doing so. And she says that she had absolutely no choice but to leave him alive at first, but she really didn't. So yeah, some characters are just bad at being bad. But it is their failures that make other villain successes all the more impressive. If we didn't have these morons, then it wouldn't be so awesome when better written villains prove that they really are smart. So thank you, incompetent evil masterminds, for allowing us to appreciate just how much better than you other villains can be. I'm my ruler of time, and if you're still watching this, then by now you have fallen under my control. Yes! 
Phase one of my incredibly complex plan to rule the world is now a success. <laughs> now, follow my commands, my followers. My first is this. Forget what they taught you in school. Always read right to left. How is this going to work? I am